our STI treatment guidelines webinar. We're gonna let a few more participants get in the room. We just opened up the room. So welcome to our webinar today. All right, well, we show the top of the hour, so we're gonna get started. Again, we are so excited to have you at the National Network of STD Clinical Prevention Training Centers, STI Treatment Guideline Webinar. My name is Helen Burnside and I'm with the National Coordination Center on behalf of our great network. And I'm gonna take a couple minutes to orient you to the logistics of today's webinar, as well as some important resources. I do want to let you know that you will have access to the PowerPoint from today's webinar, as well as the recording through our learning management system within 72 hours. And although I know we spend a lot of time on Zoom, I want to let you know that our producer is available via chat uh, to help you with any technical difficulties should you experience them today. So our network is made up of eight regional prevention training centers, as well as two national centers. We are funded by CDC's Division of STD Prevention to train healthcare providers on the treatment, diagnosis, and prevention of STIs. We wanna make sure if you are not aware that our National Curriculum Center has a fabulous STD curriculum, you'll see the URL here and we'll also place it on the chat this team is working very hard to align these modules to the 2021 STI treatment guidelines, and they will be sending more information soon about when this phase two, the second edition, will be released. In addition, we want to make sure that you all know our regional faculty, like the faculty members presenting today, offer STD clinical consultation through stdccn.org. This is a no cost system where you can submit clinical consultation questions through this portal and be connected to our regional faculty who can respond within one to five business days. So this is a great resource for you as you leave today's webinar. We also wanna make sure that you know about the National STD Registry Project. So the National Association of City and County Health Officials, as well as the Division of STD Prevention are striving to build an STD clinic registry. If you work in an STD clinic and have not completed this, we would really appreciate if you grab the URL that our producer is posting in the chat right now, go ahead and open that page or bookmark it so that you can complete it and help us make this important registry for national STD clinics. And then finally, we are offering continuing education for today's webinar. This is gonna be through the CDC's training and education online system. So after the webinar, a couple hours after we reconcile who attended today's webinar, you will receive an email with instructions for how to complete the evaluation and obtain continuing education. We do want you to know that there is a deadline. So we ask that you submit and obtain these uh, CE certificates by October 22nd. But again, you will receive an email with this information after today's webinar. For the webinar today, our faculty will share updates included in the 2021 STI treatment guidelines, discuss the rationale for these updates and align clinical practice with updated guidelines. We will be presenting information for the first 65 to 70 minutes, and we'll have about 20 minutes to answer your questions. I do wanna point out that the chat today is really for communication of resources, and we ask that you submit the questions that come to mind through the Q&A function. You should find that on the toolbar of Zoom. It will say Q&A, and we ask that you submit your questions there, and we're gonna to try to get to as many questions as we can. So with that, we have an amazing group of clinical faculty members across four of our regional prevention training centers, and I'm excited for the lineup that we have today. We have one disclosure that you'll see here on the slides. We do want to let you know that we have reviewed the content to ensure there is no bias, and we will not include any discussion of unlabeled use of a product. So with that, I am very excited to turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Catherine Hsu.
Thank you so much, Helen. Great to see everybody today. I'll be your first speaker from the National Network of STD Clinical Prevention Training Centers, discussing the state of STIs in the United States and how we can address this growing problem. Next slide, please. These are the latest data reported by CDC, and you can see that in 2019, approximately 1.8 million chlamydia, over 600,000 gonorrhea, over 100,000 syphilis, and close to 2,000 cases of congenital syphilis were reported to CDC. Each infection has shown increases when compared to cases reported in 2015. Next slide. The vantage point across three decades of surveillance information is even more concerning. From this graphic of total numbers of infectious syphilis and gonorrhea cases reported to CDC, we can see we have returned to 1990s levels of cases for these two STDs. I am using them to make the point that we are likely back to the 80s in terms of case report volumes, unless we step in with clinical and public health action. Next slide. National numbers, though, do not tell the full story. While the problem of STIs is enormous and growing, at the state or county level or within clinics, epidemiologists and clinicians see individuals who return repeatedly infected with STIs. Well-applied clinical interventions, such as regular and frequent STI screening, and effective treatment and partner management are some of our tools for reducing population burden of STIs. Next slide. Today's webinar is therefore designed to update clinicians on the latest, most effective STI management strategies. We will be providing updates based on the 2021 CDC STI guidelines, which many of you have already visited on the internet. Today's updates are roughly laid out in the order of the table of contents of that document. We will not, however, be able to cover the entire document, which is an approximately 200 page morbidity and mortality weekly report publication. But the guidelines and many provider resources are available on the web. Next slide. I'll now turn the microphone over to Dr. Kevin Art. Thank you. My topic for today will be a focus on the updates in prevention and special populations. Next slide, please. One of the main updates in prevention is on expedited partner therapy or EPT for men who have sex with men. In 2015, the guidelines did not recommend EPT for MSM routinely. And the rationale for that was that studies had shown a fairly high rate of HIV and other conditions in MSM who were the contacts of other MSM with chlamydia or gonorrhea. And so there was a concern that those other conditions, including HIV, would not be diagnosed if these men received EPT. A more recent study has shown that at least in New York City, among 4,390 visits among uh, MSM who were presenting as contacts for gonorrhea or chlamydia, that those with a chlamydia contact had a very low rate of HIV, just at 0.2% of those visits. And so in this most recent version of the guidelines, <clears throat> EPT is recommended for MSM on the basis of shared decision-making. So EPT is now more permissive for MSM. Next slide, please. There were also some updates for pregnant people. The recommendation now is to retest for syphilis at 28 weeks gestation. Um, previously, it was early in the third trimester. And so there's now a more specific recommendation. And also to test for syphilis at delivery in an area with high syphilis prevalence or if the person has risk factors for syphilis. And those risk factors are outlined. They include drug use, an STI during pregnancy, multiple sex partners or a new sex partner, or a sex partner who has an STI. And the background here, of course, is the rise in congenital syphilis cases that we've seen over the past several years. Um, which of course can have devastating impacts on a fetus or on an infant. Next slide, please. 
<clears throat> Another update was a move from risk-based hepatitis C screening among pregnant people to universal hepatitis C screening, with the 2021 guidelines stating that hepatitis C screening should be performed for all pregnant women during each pregnancy, except in settings where the positivity rate is very low. On the right-hand side of the slide, I've shown some of the data that supported this new guideline. This comes from a Wisconsin Medicaid population and shows that the rate of people um, presenting for birth who have evidence of hepatitis C infection during pregnancy has doubled from 2011 to 2015. Next slide, please. There additionally were some updates for adolescents. In 2015, there was no recommendation on extragenital chlamydia and gonorrhea testing for female adolescents. But in this most recent version of the guidelines, it's recommended to consider rectal chlamydia and gonorrhea testing and pharyngeal gonorrhea testing for females through shared decision-making based on their reported sexual history. And this is because several studies have shown that a significant minority of women who have sex with men will have extragenital chlamydia or gonorrhea infections, which can be asymptomatic um, as in other populations. Next slide, please. Beyond EPT, an additional update for MSM um, from 2015 to 21 to 2021 is to offer extragenital testing to MSM even who do not report um, oral or anal sex because of the potential for underreporting of those risk factors. Next slide, please. <clears throat> there were also some updates for transgender and gender diverse people. In 2015, the guidelines stated that we should test for STIs on the basis of behavioral history and sexual practices. And in 2021, there are some more details provided here. Um, so they make the comment that screening should be based on anatomy. So for example, in a transmasculine person with a cervix who has vaginal or frontal sex, then chlamydia or gonorrhea screening would be recommended for that person if they were younger than 25. In addition, for transgender people with HIV who have sex with cisgender men or transgender women, Yearly syphilis, hepatitis free, and multi-site chlamydia and gonorrhea testing is recommended. Multi-site chlamydia and gonorrhea testing is also specifically recommended for transgender women, although the guidelines note that the preferred testing strategy for the neo-vagina, whether that's a swab or a urine test, is not known. And then the guidelines also note um, that transgender men who've had a metoidioplasty without vaginectomy and who are engaging in vaginal or frontal sex that they should be tested for chlamydia and gonorrhea with a cervical swab. And this is really um, um, just an, another example of basing testing on anatomy. Next slide, please. Uh, the final group for which there are updates is people in correctional settings. In 2015, the guidelines recommended screening for chlamydia and gonorrhea among women 35 years and younger, and for chlamydia among men younger than 30 years and then syphilis screening based on local prevalence. In the most recent iteration of the guidelines, um, there's a clarification or a, a new recommendation that screening should be offered on an opt-out basis for chlamydia and gonorrhea, for syphilis, also for trichomonas for women younger than 25 years old, and for HIV as well. In addition, there's a recommendation to start HIV pre-exposure prophylaxis or PrEP for people who may benefit from it and to start ART for those with a new diagnosis of HIV or who've been previously diagnosed and are not on treatment. And then there are also recommendations about viral hepatitis. The guidelines recommend that people be screened for hepatitis A, B, and C, and that those who are susceptible be vaccinated. But they also point out that pre-vaccination serologic testing should not hinder the administration of vaccines. If those vaccines are given to someone who is already immune or who has one of those infections, um, they would not be anticipated to cause additional harm. Next slide, please. With that, I want to pass the microphone to my colleague, Dr. Khalil Ghanem, to talk about genital ulcer disease. Thank you, Kevin. Welcome, everyone. It's so good to have you here with us today. 
Uh, next slide, please. I'll be covering uh, syphilis and herpes simplex virus today. There are other genital ulcer diseases, but given the time, I can only cover these two. Uh, let's start with syphilis first. Um, not much change, not, not many changes to the treatment or diagnostics of syphilis. However, follow-up of syphilis has changed between 2015 and 2021. One of the common questions that comes up is, what do you do with RPR titers that don't respond appropriately? And the 2021 guidelines try to provide additional information. So if you have a patient that is treated appropriately for their stage of syphilis, and the patient does not experience a fourfold decline in titers, please remember that you should wait a full 12 months in the setting of early syphilis and a full 24 months or two years in the setting of late latent syphilis before you label that patient not having responded uh, appropriately in terms of titers. So make sure that you wait 12 months and 24 months in the setting of late latent syphilis, 12 months in the setting of early syphilis before you label somebody non-responsive. If at 12 months and 24 months, those patients' titers have not decreased fourfold, you must first ascertain that they don't have any neurological, ocular, or otic signs and symptoms. Uh, and if they do, if they have neurological signs and symptoms, you should perform a lumbar puncture. If they have otic uh, or ocular signs and symptoms, you should refer them for immediate evaluation of ocular or otic syphilis. Assuming that the patients don't have any of these signs or symptoms, the next step is figure out if the patient could have been reinfected. If the patient could have been reinfected, then just retreat them. Uh, and usually in that case, you would treat them with three doses of benzathine penicillin G. Assuming they don't have any neurological, otic, or ocular signs or symptoms, and they have not been reinfected, then you have two options after you've waited a full 12 or 24 months. The first option is do nothing and follow the patient. The second option is to go ahead and retreat the patient. There have been four observational studies that have been done that looked at that question. And based on those four observational studies, in the intermediate term, it doesn't make a difference if you retreat the patient or if you just follow them. And so the recommendation is uh, there are no short or intermediate term benefits to additional antibiotics. As long as you're able to follow the patient, that's what you need to do, assuming that you've ruled out any neurological signs or symptoms and that you've ruled out the possibility of reinfection. Now, what happens with patients who experience a fourfold increase in titers after appropriate therapy? Well, uh, if they have any neurological signs or symptoms, you should perform an LP. If they have ocular or otic signs and symptoms, refer them immediately for evaluation of ocular or otic syphilis. If the patient could have been reinfected, then all you have to do is retreat them. Uh, and usually in that setting, again, you would treat with three doses of benzathine penicillin G. If the patient denies the possibility of reinfection and the titer continues to be elevated when repeated two weeks later, you should consider performing a lumbar puncture to rule out the possibility of underlying asymptomatic neurosyphilis. Please keep in mind that an increase in titer uh, should be redocumented two weeks later if you've ruled out the possibility of reinfection. If they got reinfection, you don't have to wait two weeks, you can treat them immediately. But if they deny reinfection, then confirm that the titer is increased by checking the titer again two weeks later. If the titer is still elevated two weeks later, then you should consider the possibility of doing a lumbar puncture to rule out underlying asymptomatic neurosyphilis. Next slide, please. Now, another big question that always comes up is who should undergo a CSF examination or a lumbar puncture? The guidelines also try to be more explicit. Of course, anybody that has neurological signs or symptoms should undergo a lumbar puncture. Certainly any patient that's diagnosed with tertiary syphilis, i.e. cardiovascular or gummitous syphilis, because about 30% of those patients will also have underlying asymptomatic neurosyphilis, and it will change management. If they have neurosyphilis, you would treat them with 14 days of IV penicillin. If they don't, you can get away with treating cardiovascular and gummitous syphilis with three doses of benzathine penicillin G. And then you should consider in those individuals whose titers go up fourfold if you've ruled out reinfection and if 
if two weeks later the titers are still elevated. That's the that's the group. Those are the groups uh, in which a lumbar puncture uh, uh, has been shown to make a difference. There are no data to support routine lumbar punctures in asymptomatic persons living with HIV. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't do a lumbar puncture. It just means that there are no data to support lumbar puncture if your uh, patient living with HIV has no signs, symptoms uh, consistent with neurosyphilis. And then uh, a final change that has happened in the setting of neurosyphilis is that there is no longer routine need for a lumbar puncture six months after treating somebody for neurosyphilis, assuming that they are immunocompetent or there's someone living with HIV who are on uh, antiretroviral therapy. As long as they respond clinically to the penicillin, and as long as their serological RPR titers are declining appropriately. So in other words, when you do a lumbar puncture and you treat somebody with neurosyphilis, there is no reason to repeat the lumbar puncture six months later if the person is clinically doing better and their RPR titers are declining appropriately. This does not apply to individuals who are living with HIV who are not on antiretroviral therapy. In those individuals, you should continue to do a six-month follow-up lumbar puncture to make sure that uh, their CSF is responding appropriately. Next slide. Now, uh, some changes related to otosyphilis and ocular syphilis. Uh, please keep in mind that with ocular syphilis, the 2015 guidelines recommended a CSF examination, those patients to make a diagnosis. But uh, it is clear that up to 40% of persons with ocular syphilis will essentially have a normal CSF exam, and you will still need to actually treat them for ocular syphilis despite the normal CSF examination. So in the setting of ocular syphilis, the recommendation now is to go ahead and begin treatment without a CSF examination, assuming there are no other neurological signs or symptoms. So if a patient presents with ocular only signs and symptoms, they must be evaluated immediately by an ophthalmologist. And if there are lesions noted, uh, on the examination, then a presumptive diagnosis of ocular syphilis is made and the patient should be treated with 10 to 14 days of IV penicillin. The use of steroids, it's unclear whether it adds any benefit. There have not been any consistent studies that demonstrate uh, either lack of benefit or benefit. And so it really depends um, on the clinical situation. If there are no contraindications to steroids, then you can certainly use steroids in that setting. With otosyphilis, up to 90% of persons with otosyphilis will have a normal CSF examination. And so in the setting of otosyphilis, again, you do not need to do a lumbar puncture. So if a patient has serological evidence of syphilis with hearing loss, vertigo, and or tinnitus, and you suspect otosyphilis, refer them immediately to the emergency room, and they will need to be started on IV penicillin, again, for 10 to 14 days, plus minus steroids same as ocular syphilis. No good data on whether we should or should not be using steroids in that setting. Next slide. Syphilis update during pregnancy. Kevin actually covered many of these factors. There are now risk factors that are listed, uh, maternal risk factors listed for syphilis. Uh, and I want to highlight two other important issues. Uh, there is now some wording in the guidelines that says certain evidence indicates that additional therapy is beneficial for pregnant women to prevent congenital syphilis. For women who have primary, secondary, or early latent syphilis, a second dose of benzathine penicillin G 2.4 million units can be administered one week after the initial dose. I'll highlight that the data behind that are limited, and so you can still use a single dose of benzathine penicillin G to treat all your uh, pregnant patients who have early syphilis, but there are some experts that would recommend an additional dose. Finally, uh, if you're treating a pregnant patient with three doses of benzathine penicillin G one week apart, the amount of time uh, between doses has been extended from seven days between the doses to nine days between the doses. So if it's within nine days that a patient got their previous dose, you can just give them the subsequent dose. If it's more than nine days, you have to start over again. Next slide. 
HSV update, there have been unfortunately no changes in terms of the treatment. However, there have been changes in terms of diagnostics. PCR is an excellent test when a lesion is present. However, when a lesion is absent and you wish to do HSV serological testing and you're planning on using a glycoprotein G-based uh, IgG test, which is what you should be using, there are issues with the specificity of these IgG2 EIAs. Also, CIAs. It applies to CIAs as well, even though we have more limited data on that. But it appears that when the index value, when the EIA index value is less than three, the specificity is quite low. In other words, when the index value is less than three, there is an increased risk of having false positive tests. So when you order that serological test and the index value is less than three, you need to obtain a second confirmatory test before you tell the patient that they are positive for HSV2 antibodies. And the two recommended second tests are either the HSV2 Western blot, which is only performed at the University of Washington, or the HSV2 BioKit rapid test, which has a high specificity. And so if you're gonna test somebody with an HSV2 EIA or CIA, you have to be prepared to do a second test if their index value is less than three to decrease the risk of having a false positive test re report reported to your patient. And then the CDC now, the guidelines highlight again that you should never use IgM serologies, never order them and never try to interpret them because they are not specific for early HSV infection because many patients who have positive IgM serologies may have chronic HSV infection and some patients with early uh, HSV infection will have negative IgM antibodies. So don't use or try to interpret IgM antibodies. Next slide. Uh, and then for uh, uh, HSV in the setting of HIV and pregnancy, keep in mind that persons living with HIV with a CD4 count less than 200 and a history of genital herpes, you should consider six months of HSV suppressive therapy when initiating ART, uh, ART to decrease the reactivation potential of genital herpes. So for six months, treat them with ART. And then during pregnancy, at the onset of labor, all women should be questioned thoroughly about symptoms of genital herpes, including prodromal symptoms. So in the past, we used to say that if they have active lesions at the time of delivery, a C-section should be performed. Now it has expanded to in individuals who are pregnant at the time of delivery, if they have lesions or if they have prodromal symptoms, they should also undergo a C-section because they're probably with prodromal symptoms uh, actively shedding the virus. So that hopefully will decrease the risk of transmitting it to the newborn. Next slide. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Candice McNeil. Thanks very much. Thank you. So next slide. So the availability and use of effective antimicrobials against gonorrhea are really necessary to move the bar on gonorrhea control. After some 40 years of using penicillin, there was a progressive decline in the susceptibility leading to treatment with ceftriaxone as the base for uncomplicated gonorrhea in the mid eighties. Additional classes were subsequently lost along the way, including our tetracyclines and fluoroquinolones, leaving us with cephalosporins as the only class to treat gonorrhea. Now, dual therapy was implemented in 2010 and further refined in 2015 in order to protect this precious class. However, by 2019, only 45% of gonorrhea is susceptible to all antibiotics, a stark change from the decade prior. Next slide. So the guidelines had to change. Uh, they changed to improve antimicrobial stewardship, taking into account pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic considerations, and also changes in azithromycin susceptibility. With the overall goal when treating infection is to make sure that the affected individuals are treated to prevent the development of complications and from the public health standpoint, shorten the duration of infection and decrease transmission and eliminate reservoirs of infection. Next slide. Drug resistant gonorrhea is an urgent threat. When looking through the lens of stewardship, there is a recognized need to minimize antimicrobial exposure unless the risks outweigh the benefits. And the data that we have support there is harm to the microbiome. We've seen that in pediatric patients receiving azithromycin where there had been increased determinants of macrolide resistance and even non-macrolide resistance. 
And we've also noticed further resistance trends for enteric pathogens and mycoplasma genitalium. Next slide. Mycoplasma genitalium is a pathogen gaining increasing notoriety due to associations with specific SCI syndromes and tendency towards resistance. Looking at 23S RNA as a marker for macrolide resistance in the US over multiple studies, you can see resistance ranging from 44% to 90%. Unfortunately, most strains with macrolide resistance do ultimately fail treatment with macrolides. Next slide. Resistance patterns in enteric pathogens such as Campylobacter and Shigella have also highlighted the presence of macrolide resistance and multidrug resistance. These implications go beyond the treatment of classic enteric illness and into the realm of sexually transmittable syndromes. Um, enteric illnesses, um, which may be found in certain populations that are presenting with outbreaks of GI illness and social and sexual networks, such as men who have sex with men. Additionally, you should note that there can be concurrent SCIs in this population that are worth considering, including chlamydia, syphilis, HIV, and of course, gonorrhea. Next slide. Identification of Neisseria gonorrhea infections with reduced susceptibility can be a sign of emerging resistance. Notable on this graph, you can see that the ceftriaxone MIC ranges um, in ele when elevation is seen can range in 0.1 to 0.4%. While in the background, you can see azithromycin MICs MIC elevation progressively increasing over 2019 and 2000, over 2012 to 2019. Next slide. Accounting for elevated MICs. And in order to treat gonorrhea infections effectively, we need to have drug levels above the MIC for the right duration. Modeling studies and murine models have been used to determine the optimal duration and dose. And those studies have demonstrated that ceftriaxone at a 500 milligram dose is optimal for treatment. However, there are some uncertainties regarding pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics at the pharynx. Next slide. So asymptomatic infections are pretty common at the pharynx. If you don't screen at the pharynx, you may not identify these infections. And we know that uh, these sites are often scream less often than the genitals. Globally, most reported ceftriaxone-based regimen treatment failures have involved the pharyngeal site. They can be difficult to eradicate and fewer regimens can achieve that greater than 90% cure rate that we strive for. So for these reasons, we also have the additional recommendation that a test of cure be performed at seven to 14 days. And I would encourage you to consider towards the latter end of this range, because we know that there is potential for gnats to detect remnant nucleic acids, which may not represent live organisms. Next slide. To recap, the current treatment recommendation for uncomplicated gonorrhea is that 500 milligrams of IM ceftriaxone. You're gonna increase that to one gram in individuals greater than 150 kilos. When chlamydia has not been excluded, it is recommended that you use either doxycycline or azithromycin. And Dr. Zucker will talk to you a little bit more about that decision-making process. Next slide. Next slide, please. Thank you. In situations when ceftriaxone, back up a slide, please. In situations where ceftriaxones cannot be used, cefixime 800 milligrams PO once may be used. Note here, the dosing is 800 milligrams, which is a change from the prior guidelines, which recommended 400. And this change in dose was to overcome potential resistance. An important caveat is that cefixime does not provide as high or sustained bactericidal blood levels as does ceftriaxone and demonstrates limited efficacy at the pharynx. The other alternative listed here includes azithromycin and gentamicin. This may be a regimen that you consider in cases of allergy. In terms of trials that support its use for this indication referenced in the guidelines, there's one that does not have the power to provide reliable estimates at rectal and pharyngeal sites. And there's another one whereby there was really low performance at the rectal and pharyngeal sites. So I would encourage you that if you're in a situation where you're going to use this regimen, that you make sure that there is, that this is a true IgE mediated allergy. Okay, next slide. Other changes in gonorrhea treatment. So we know that we have to increase the dose of ceftriaxone in order to best treat gonorrhea. The other syndromes affected in the guidelines are listed here. And also in instances where you see dual therapy reference, this is no longer the way that we treat gonorrhea. Next slide. 
So suspected cephalosporin treatment failure. You should consider this in persons whose symptoms don't resolve in three to five days after treatment. Most times this failure is due to reinfection. However, there can at times be concerns for cephalosporin treatment failure. If there's persistence of Neisseria gonorrhea despite the recommended treatment and there's not been an interim sexual exposure, so when you encounter these scenarios, you wanna make sure that you have culture to get your antimicrobial susceptibility test. If it's reinfection that you're concerned about, then you're gonna go ahead and retreat with ceftriaxone. And if you're concerned about cephalosporin failure specifically, you're gonna use your gentamicin, azithromycin dosing, test of cure in seven to 14 days, though towards the latter end of that range would be better, and have your culture and your NAT done simultaneously so that you can follow that up. If you are still encountering issues with that persistently positive cultures, please consult your infectious disease specialist and SCI clinic expert or, um, or others who might have expertise in this area. Make sure people are notified, including the CDC through your local health department or your state. Next slide. Switching gears here to talk about um, non-gonococcal urethritis. So point of care diagnostics are incredibly useful in establishing diagnosis for NGU. When we have individuals coming in with symptoms of urethritis who are sexually active, this is a tool that we often rely on, that gram stain of urethral secretions. The, two that, the 2021 guidelines highlight a change in this area, specifically the cutoff, looking at prevalence. So in your STI clinic settings, greater than two white blood cells per high-powered field versus in your low prevalence settings, greater than five white cells per high-powered field. Another thing that's been highlighted is a change um, in the pathogens that are highlighted in the guidelines. So chlamydia is by far still gonna be your most common pathogen that you look for, that guides your testing and your treatment. However, other pathogens to consider are the other Neisseria, that is Neisseria meningitidis, which can colonize mucosal surfaces and cause urethritis, can be transmitted by oral sex and is hard to distinguish from Neisseria gonorrhea. And then the other pathogen I want you to remember is of course, um, Mycoplasma genitalium. Next slide. So Mycoplasma genitalium is associated with a number of syndromes, including persistent urethritis. Um, you should consider it in cases of cervicitis and PID and upper tract disease in men, such as persistent epididymitis. There are no recommendations for screening for Mycoplasma genitalium on the population level, but it is permissive to screen in patients who have urethritis. Mycoplasma genitalium is really hard to culture. So the main way we're gonna diagnose this is by using a NAT. Um, there is an FDA approved diagnostic that's out there where you can use it at multiple sites um, as listed here. Now, partners who are symptomatic should be tested and treatment it, um, should be administered if available. Um, and treatment here is guided by resistance. So um, the challenge here is that molecular testing for macrolides and quinolone mutations are not commercially available. So let's talk about how to operationalize this recommendation. Next slide. So this guidance listed on this slide is based on data out of the Melbourne Sexual Health Center where resistance guiding therapy has been in place since about 2016. Data published by Durkan et al. in 2019 evaluated the use of moxifloxacin in this population as a second drug along with azithromycin in individuals who have a susceptible uh, variety of gonorrhea. So individuals enrolled in this study, they had urethritis, cervicitis, PID, proctitis, or were a contact to mycoplasma genitalium. They had mycoplasma genitalium testing and they also had macrolide susceptibility testing. Initial antimicrobial was doxycycline. Second antimicrobial was gonna be based on that mac macrolide resistance. And what they did was they had them come back in for a test of cure sometime later. What they found was doxycycline decreased the bacterial load. The cure rate was 95% in those macrolide sensitive specimens and 92% in macrolide resistant specimens. Notably, there was a uh, low selection for macrolide resistance in this population, less than 3.8%. So the guidelines recommend doxy to knock down the load. And then from there, I would say in the absence of resistance testing, and this is also referenced in the guidelines, you're gonna go with moxifloxacin. Reserving that azithromycin for situations where resistance is low or moxifloxacin cannot be administered. I would now like to turn over my slides to Dr. Zucker. Thank you very much and good afternoon, everyone. It's now my pleasure to talk with you about the 2021 updates to the management of chlamydia including associated syndromes like cervicitis and proctitis, as well as expedited partner therapy. Next slide. 
Chlamydia infection is the most frequently reported bacterial infectious disease in the United States. This means that numerically, the biggest change in the guidelines is a change to the treatment for uncomplicated chlamydia. Previously, we used azithromycin or doxycycline for the treatment of chlamydia. However, now doxycycline, 100 milligrams twice daily for seven days is the preferred regimen. It's important to know that azithromycin one gram has not been removed, but has been moved to an alternative regimen along with levofloxacin, 500 milligrams daily for seven days. It's important to remember now that because of this change, that doxycycline is to be avoided in pregnancy. And so azithromycin remains the preferred agent in pregnancy with amoxicillin 500 milligrams three times a day as an alternative. Erythromycin is no longer recommended because of the frequency of GI side effects. Next slide. So this is a significant change. So why did the treatment recommendations for chlamydia change? Well, first is for genital urinary infection. There are two recent reviews of treatment of urogenital chlamydial infection that found that microbiologic treatment failure among men was higher for azithromycin than doxycycline, although the difference was small. The next issue is rectal infection. The updated guidelines suggest that rectal screening can be considered for females on the basis of reported sexual behaviors and exposure through a shared clinical decision-making approach by patient and provider. But receptive anal intercourse is a poor indicator for the need for rectal treatment because it's not just sexual behaviors that matter. Rectal infection is not uncommon among women with genital urinary infection, among women with genital urinary infection, ranging from 33 to 83%, regardless of behavioral risk factors, likely due to auto inoculation from the urogenital site. If rectal chlamydia is inadequately treated, women are at increased risk for repeat urogenital infection through auto inoculation from the anal rectal site. So treating rectal chlamydia adequately is important. And so an important reason for this change is that doxycycline has been found to be superior to azithromycin in two recently published randomized controlled trials with a 20 to 26% difference in efficacy. Next slide. So in choosing a treatment for chlamydia, you're really trying to balance the efficacy of doxycycline versus the ease of azithromycin. Access is one difference, as many clinics and emergency departments may be unable to provide seven-day courses of doxycycline, while most of them can provide a single dose of azithromycin. Patients who are uninsured may only be able to obtain what they can get in their local clinic or emergency department. And the challenge is also magnified for adolescents and young adults who have additional insurance challenges. And for example, in one study from Washington, DC, found that only 58% of adolescents who had a prescription for an STI filled it. Adherence is a second difference. It's easier to take one gram once than it is to take a medication twice a day for seven days. However, it's important that we set our own judgments aside. And I know that when the gonorrhea update came out in December, there was a lot of concerns about the seven days versus one dose, but I find that most patients can do it. And frequently the ones that can't will tell you. Additionally, in recent randomized controlled trials, azithromycin performed so poorly that even in the context of imperfect adherence, doxycycline is likely better. Finally, there are issues around confidentiality. Patients may value not having pills in the house. They may not want a parent or friend or roommate to find out and being able to treat them with a single dose at the point of care may be beneficial. Next slide. So in general, you wanna choose azithromycin in patients who are pregnant or may be pregnant, patients with a history of allergy or intolerance to doxycycline, patients who are unlikely to be adherent, or patients who are unlikely to be able to obtain doxycycline and azithromycin is available at the point of care. Next slide. Moving on to cervicitis. Cervicitis is frequently asymptomatic, but can be identified by purulent or mucopurulent endocervical exudate or sustained endocervical bleeding. While frequently no organism identified, the most common identified organisms include chlamydia and gonorrhea, and the ideal treatment is based on knowing the pathogen. For persistent cervicitis, an additional new pathogen is to consider mycoplasma genitalium, which Dr. McDeal previously discussed. And don't forget about non-infectious etiologies. Many persistent cases of cervicitis are not caused by reinfection with traditional pathogens, but include other factors like abnormal vaginal flora, douching, irritants, or idiopathic inflammation. For persistent symptoms of cervicitis without an etiology, consider a referral to gynecology for a non-infectious workup, which may also include looking for cervical dysplasia or polyps. Next slide. When treating cervicitis empirically, you're treating first for chlamydia. Previously, the treatment of cervicitis was again azithromycin or doxycycline, but consistent with the rest of the guideline, doxycycline is now the preferred agent with, with azithromycin as an alternative. Unchanged from the previous guidelines is concurrent treatment for gonococcal infection if the patient is at increased risk for gonorrhea, but now with the change in dose to the ceftriaxone to 500 milligrams or oral septic of ceftriaxone is not available. Next slide. 
With regards to proctitis or inflammation of the rectum, we have our traditional pathogens, and the initial evaluation should still include gonorrhea, chlamydia, HSV, and syphilis. Molecular testing for LGV is not FDA cleared or widely available. However, testing should be considered if available. As you'll notice, it's becoming a theme. They also make note about a new pathogen, and it's, again, it's mycoplasma genitalium. While the pathogenic role of mycoplasma genitalium and proctitis is being fully elucidated, the guidelines do recommend that for persons with persistent symptoms after standard treatment, that you can consider testing for mycoplasma genitalium and treating if it's positive. Next slide. The treatment for proctitis remains mostly the same with treatment for both gonorrhea and chlamydia, but updated with the increased dose of ceftriaxone. Unchanged from before adoxycycline for seven days or 21 days for individuals meeting criteria for LGV with bloody discharge, perianal and mucosal ulcers, or tenesmus. Next slide. Finally, with regards to repeat testing, we frequently get questions about when patients can resume sexual activity. For individuals treated with seven days of doxycycline, they can resume after the completion of therapy, or seven days after patients who receive single dose therapy. Retesting should be at four weeks if pregnant or three months to rule out reinfection. One minor additional thing to consider is that you can consider post-treatment testing for patients with rectal chlamydia treated with azithromycin due to its lower efficacy. I generally won't do this any earlier than four weeks due to the sensitivity of nucleic acid amplification testing and the risk of false positives from non-viable organisms. Next slide. So for patients with gonorrhea or chlamydia, the CDC recommends management of sex partners and expedited partner therapy or treating the sex partners without seeing the partner. It's exciting that EPT is now permissible or potentially allowable in all 50 states and not prohibited in any. However, remember that many states may have restrictions on who can get EPT and what or how medications can be prescribed, and you need to check your state legislation before prescribing. Next slide. While EPT is an option when managing sex partners, the primary goal is to get the partner to come into clinic for evaluation. Having partners come with patients when they come in for treatment is one way to get partners into care. Having partners come in for care is important because partners may need more than just treatment. A visit is also a chance to provide comprehensive sexual health services, including HIV and syphilis testing and discussions around HIV prevention services for both the patient and partner. If partners are unable to come in promptly or at all, expedited partner therapy as a section, second option should be considered. Previously, expedited therapy was available and recommended for heterosexual couples. However, as Dr. Ard highlighted at the beginning, in this recent update, the CDC has made EPT permissive for men who have sex with men through a shared decision-making approach. While the data is limited on the effectiveness of EPT and MSM, it is an additional option in cases where it's needed. Next slide, please. For expedited partner therapy and for treatment of gonorrhea, the treatment is cefixime, 800 milligrams PO times once, which is the same as our additional um, option for gonorrhea treatment. For chlamydia, this is actually different than most of the guidelines where there is no recommended and alternative agent specifically for EPT and chlamydia. So for chlamydia, the options are either doxycycline, 100 milligrams twice a day for seven days, or azithromycin one gram once. One of the challenges is that most studies of EPT use azithromycin, so that is where most of the evidence is. In general, a shared decision-making approach is to encourage partners to take doxycycline when rectal infections are likely and pregnancy is unlikely. I often use doxycycline for most men who have sex with men, frequently use azithromycin for men who have sex with women. And for women who have sex with men, it really depends on how confident you can be about their pregnancy status, if I can, or if I can speak with them directly. But I often default to azithromycin when I can't. With that said, what's clear is that EPT is potentially beneficial, but there's no easy algorithm for choosing medications and a shared decision-making approach is the best. And with that said, I'll turn it over to Dr. Erica Hardy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I'll be focusing on the new 2021 updates to the sections on trichomonas, pelvic inflammatory disease, and sexual assault. So as you remember, the 2015 guidelines recommended single-dose therapy with either metronidazole or tinidazole for men and women with trichomonas. The update for 2021 is that for women, the recommended treatment is now metronidazole 500 milligrams twice daily for seven days, which is what we've been uh, treating women living with HIV with. And now alternative therapy for men and women is moved, uh, is tinidazole in a two gram single dose. Because there's no published data on the seven day regimen for men, there's been no change from the single dose therapy for men with or without HIV. Next slide. 
The rationale between the, uh, behind these changes were largely due to this randomized controlled clinical trial of a single dose versus seven day regimen in women. So as you can see, this was a multi-center open label RCT uh, performed at three sexual health clinics in the US. Subjects were randomized to two grams of metronidazole in a single dose versus 500 milligrams twice a day for seven days. The primary outcome was trichomonas vaginalis at test of cure four weeks after treatment. And what you can see is that the seven day group was less likely to be trichomonas positive at test of cure, uh, about 11% versus 19%, so about half. Uh, what they found was that bacterial vaginosis status had no significant effect on the relative risk. Self-reported adherence was similar in both groups as were side effects. Next slide. In terms of recurrent or persistent trichomoniasis, uh, most of this is secondary to reinfection. Uh, in 2021, there was some additional guidance for those with persistent infection not due to reinfection, and the recommendation is to request a resistance testing kit and testing from the CDC earlier. Um, and this link is embedded in the STI treatment guidelines. So with resistant testing, resistance testing, combination therapy may be recommended. So metronidazole or tinidazole in a two gram daily dose, so high dose therapy for seven days may be recommended. Um, if that fails to cure, then combination therapy may be the next step, which would be tinidazole at a high dose, two grams daily, um, plus intravaginal tinidazole, 500 milligrams twice a day for 14 days. An additional possibility would be tinidazole in a high dose, one gram three times a day, plus intravaginal paramomycin at the dose you can see here for 14 days. Next slide, please. Uh, one addition, the 2015 guidelines stated that alcohol consumption should be avoided during treatment with the nitroimidazoles. Um, after further review of the evidence, the 2021 guidelines state that abstaining from alcohol after metronidazole or tinidazole is not needed. Uh, it's explained that a lot of the prior studies were based on animal studies and case histories, and the reports of adverse effects with the two may actually be the result of either the alcohol or metronidazole side effects independently. So metronidazole also does not inhibit acetaldehyde dehydrogenase like disulfiram does, so no longer uh, need to be avoided. Next slide. Moving on to the treatment of PID. Um, in 2015, we didn't have the data to support a definitive recommendation for whether to add metronidazole to all cases when treating PID. In 2015, the guidelines stated that until treatment regimens that do not cover anaerobic microbes have been demonstrated to prevent long-term sequelae as successfully as the regimens that are effective against these microbes, using regimens with anaerobic activity, like with metronidazole, should be considered. Uh, in 2021, we now have published data to support the addition of metronidazole to uh, PID treatment regimens, and this is from the ACE trial, which I'll go through. The other major change in 2021 is that the uh, clindamycin and gentamicin regimen has now been moved to an alternative therapy rather than recommended. Uh, the subtriaxone intramuscular or oral regimen dosing is aligned with that recommended for gonorrhea, which we've heard earlier in the talk, um, and outpatient Continuation of therapy after clinical improvement would now be with oral doxycycline and more oral metronidazole to complete 14 days. Next slide. So this was the study that provided data that led to the definitive guideline change. So this was a randomized controlled clinical trial of ceftriaxone and doxycycline with or without metronidazole for the treatment of acute PID. This study was designed to answer the question of whether adding metronidazole improved clinical and microbiologic cure in women with acute PID. Uh, they randomized about 233 women to standard of care, which was ceftriaxone and doxycycline, or standard of care plus metronidazole, and then measured the outcomes at three and 30 days. Next slide. What you can see is that uh, clinical improvement was actually high in both groups at three days and also at 30 days. Only a small proportion of women, 22%, tested positive for chlamydia or gonorrhea. Um, as with other PID large trials, uh, as in the PEACH trial, which had 
35% of women testing positive for chlamydia or gonorrhea. Uh, rates of chlamydia and gonorrhea did not differ among the groups at 30 days. However, rates of bacterial vaginosis, as well as endometrial cultures for anaerobic organisms were significantly lower in the metronidazole arm. Uh, rates of trichomonas vaginalis also trended to lower as well, although these were not statistically significant. There were other outcomes measured that were beneficial with adding metronidazole. Pelvic tenderness was less common among women with metronidazole, about 9% versus 20%. And adverse events were actually similar in each treatment arm. Next slide. So moving on to the updates in the evaluation and treatment of the sexual assault survivor. Uh, there is now a discussion of evaluation of MSM after sexual assault, and that's new in 2021. So MSM should be offered screening for chlamydia and Neisseria gonorrhea if they report receptive oral or anal sex during the preceding year, regardless of whether such contact occurred at those anatomic sites during the assault, um, as well as the fact that anoscopy should be considered in instances of anal penetration. Uh, treatment recommendations are now given for both female and male survivors and should be based on your patient's anatomy, as was earlier discussed, and also the new dosing recommendations that have been previously reviewed for gonorrhea. Uh, the new updates for sexual assault or abuse of children in 2021 are that anogenital molluscum contagiosum was added to the table, indicating level of suspicion um, after a uh, sexual contact. So what they said for anogenital molluscum is that in terms of evidence for sexual abuse, that really still was inconclusive, and the recommended course of action would be medical follow-up um, if this was discovered. Uh, if the child is unable to verbalize uh, details of the assault, this was also added as, a, as an indication for the physician to consider STI testing. The recommendation that one can collect chlamydia and gonorrhea testing from the extragenital sites like the pharynx, rectum, as well as the vagina for girls and urine for boys, um, especially in the nonverbal or preverbal child. Trichomonas vaginalis gnat um, is now listed as possibility to use as an alternative, especially if wet mount or culture are not available. Um, and point of care tests for trichomonas have not been validated and so should not be used in this age population. The other new recommendation is that this, any vesicular ulcerative or perianal lesions can be sent for HSV gnat or viral culture. Next slide. And now I will pass the microphone back to Dr. Kathy Shu. One more slide forward. One please. more slide ahead. So to end on a few resources for all of you, next slide. First, let's start with a reminder that CDC STI guidelines are developed um, tapping into the expertise of many, many, many people across the nation. Um, at the behest of CDC, we all met together back in June of 2019 continually updated our sections pretty much up until the time that the guidelines finally got published this past year in July. These guidelines are evidence-based on principal outcomes of STD therapy, which include four goals, microbiologic eradication, alleviation of signs and symptoms, prevention of sequelae, and prevention of transmission. Recommended regimens are definitively preferred over alternative regimens, which tend to be reserved for situations where either the patient absolutely can't tolerate it or has a severe allergy. For many of you who are in the know, you also realize that the recommended regimens are alphabetized unless there is a priority of choice within the box. There are a number of resources and they are available directly on the cdc.gov STD treatment website. These include pocket guides, teaching slides, charts, and oh, the app. Hang on one second, next slide please. So the STI treatment guidelines are available. The webpage looks like this, but you know, many of you have heard me say this before, it's actually somewhat of a misnomer. They are prevention, screening, counseling, management, and treatment guidelines. They contain a wealth of information that it is worth reviewing at times when you are in puzzlement over how to manage a particular case. 
All of this is available on the web. Next slide. And we hope someday soon the app will be back to befriend us on the front lines of clinical care as well. It is under development, should be linking to us soon, and we all hope to get an update or a request for an update for the new app. Next slide. If you still have questions, please feel free to email the clinical faculty who are on call for you having those of you who have specific questions about cases, um, you can either use the NNPTC resource earmarked in the first few slides, or if you have questions specific to the STI treatment guidelines, the CDC is available as well. This resource will be published in the chat and is of course in this slide set. In terms of questions today, which we now are going to open the floor to, we may not get to all of today's questions. So please do use these web links in the future as a resource. I'll now turn the microphone over to Barbara Wilgus. Hello. So now we're gonna open up the floor to um, have a Q&A session. Um, please, if you have a question you wanted to put in, please make sure that you put it um, under the toolbar in the Q&A section. Due to the size of the webinar, um, we can only get to questions in the Q&A, not in the chat. Um, we have about 20 minutes. If we are unable to get to your question, again, um, we're going to put the email address in the chat for additional follow-up questions. So I'm going to try to collate these according to kind of the order of the presentation. So, which will get us started with um, syphilis. Um, so the first one was for Dr. Ghanem. Um, are, this is about um, titers that do not decline. Are the recommendations different for titers that do not decline if a patient is treated with doxycycline as opposed to penicillin? Nope, the recommendations are exactly the same no matter what treatment you're using. Uh, so, um, uh, you do exactly the same thing for penicillin as well as for doxycycline. And if you're using ceftriaxone for some reason, exactly the same. And there were a couple questions about rising titers uh, without a history of, uh, without previous titers. So if a patient has rising titers over, over sequential RPRs um, and they do not have prior syphilis titers available, can you assume they have an early latent syphilis infection and treat with one dose of penicillin. So you have to be careful here. Rising titers can be the result of reinfection or they can be re the result of treatment failure. In other words, an infection that's been ongoing for a long time that was controlled and then suddenly the patient has a treatment failure and develops, for example, neurosyphilis or asymptomatic neurosyphilis. So the problem is that you the, the, the answer to your question really depends on the history for that patient. If that patient had a recent exposure, suggesting that the titer increase is most likely secondary to reinfection, then yes, you can just treat with one dose of benzathine penicillin G. But if the history is equivocal or unclear, you can't assume that this is a recent infection. This could be a longstanding infection with a treatment failure that's happening recently, then you would need to use longer courses of, uh, of antibiotics. So it really depends on the situation, whether you think this is a recent reinfection or whether you don't know, or it may be a longstanding infection with a recent treatment failure. And the next uh, question is one that I suspect will probably come through the STDCCN gazillions of times over the next <laughs> five years, which is about the nine day window um, with uh, pregnancy treatment and syphilis. Um, so how exact is that time period between doses of bicillin? So for example, if the person gets a dose of bicillin in the morning, and then the subsequent dose is in the evening of day nine, is that valid or would they have to restart? Listen, the, 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 uh, I think you just have to be pragmatic here. Uh, and the way I would say is if they come in on day nine, you're okay. Even if it's a little few more hours than, than the previous dose nine days ago, you're gonna be just fine. So if they come in on day nine, you're good. Uh, if they come in on day 10, start over again. Okay, 
Um, and then there was a question about um, HSV and pregnancy. Speaking of pregnancy, um, is it appropriate to provide suppressive therapy to pregnant women um, with a history of frequent outbreaks of HSV, or would you just start that at 36 weeks only? Oh, no, no, no. You can start with suppression. Uh, preferentially, I would use acyclovir because we have the most data on its safety during pregnancy. You can use suppression throughout pregnancy. It's been shown to be safe even in the first trimester of pregnancy. So if uh, a patient who's pregnant has recurrences, uh, then by all means use it. Uh, the recommendation is to certainly use it at 36 weeks or consider using it at 36 weeks because uh, it has been shown to decrease the need for C-sections at the time of delivery, uh, but it hasn't been shown to decrease the risk of transmission to the neonate. That These data are still pending, but it does decrease the risk of uh, needing a C-section at the time of delivery. So by all means, use acyclovir whenever you need to during pregnancy, as well as starting at 36 weeks on. Okay, and so now we're gonna move on to gonorrhea. Um, so uh, what would make, the first question was, what would make a clinician suspect resistant gonorrhea? Great question. And so then what would they do? <laughs> yeah, that's also the important part, right? So, um, so suspecting resistant gonorrhea. So if we have an individual that's coming in and they are presenting with symptoms within three to five days after they were treated, that's definitely some uh, an individual where you wanna, you wanna think strongly whether there is resistant gonorrhea there. Um, but you also wanna acknowledge the fact that a lot of infections are really re-exposures. Um, and when they're coming in symptomatic, that should be something you wanna tease out really tightly in the beginning. Now, management, if you're truly thinking about cephalosporin failure here, you're gonna go with your gentamicin and your azithromycin dosing. Um, for that individual, make sure you get um, specimens done simultaneously in terms of culture and gnats and follow them up again really closely and, you know, consult us at the CCN, um, talk to your local specialists. Uh, we'd be glad to help with those types of infections. And uh, there was a question about, is it, is a test of cure always indicated for pharyngeal GC? That's a great question. And the current guidelines do recommend that uh, infections, pharyngeal infections with gonorrhea are followed with a test of cure. And this is mainly because there is concern um, with that site being uh, more susceptible to antimicrobial resistant infections and not a site that we frequently screen. Um, and um, all of the other pharmacodynamic things that we talked about, we it's one of those tools that we have available to us just to make sure that we get that infection cleared away. And what would be the best test to perform for pharyngeal or rectal gonorrhea? Great question. So definitely gnats um, are very sensitive and they have moved into being our preferred diagnostic. Uh, they, but these are not available to everybody and some may be using cultures. The challenge with cultures are that, particularly at those sites, at the pharynx and the rectum, there can be commensal pathogens, which on culture may be challenging to tease out and actually isolate the gonorrhea out of the sea of background bacteria that might be there. So I would say um, in most cases, your culture is gonna be the technology you use while you're trying to get susceptibility testing to um, help make sure that your infections are treated appropriately. If you have access to a NAT, that's definitely gonna be a more reliable way to uh, diagnose gonorrhea at those anatomic sites. And kind of a, a side with that question is, what would be the rationale for performing both a NAT and a culture when you're testing cure, test of cure for pharyngeal gonorrhea? Great question. Um, and I know this, this comes where there are some places don't have access to gnats or they might not have access to cultures. They might just have one. Now the, um, the gnats in that case, because um, they are widely available, they have been incorporated into the test of cure recommendation. That might be what the only um, testing modality that a site has. The culture in that case is to help us guide therapy. So that way we can check and screen for 
resistance, specifically uh, cephalosporin resistance so that we can direct therapy. And then also make sure that the partners are appropriately cared for as well. Uh, and then we have several MGENT questions. So I'm gonna start with, I'm gonna start with a softball. Should, uh, should, should genitalium NAT testing be incorporated with standard STI screening in patients given the data presented or should screening only be symptom or syndrome directed? You know, that, that is a great question. Um, definitely we've found that MGEN is a prevalent infection. It can co-occur with other STIs, but right now uh, there is no uh, universal screening for MGEN that's recommended. It will really move into that category of being um, tagged to syndrome-based testing. And the guidelines highlight looking at persistent infections, specifically at the urethra, also the cervix, um, also considering an upper tract disease um, in men, epididymitis, um, as the main niches for that MGEN testing. And also PID, sorry, we did mention that as well. And there were a couple questions about sequential treatment, um, which is basically, so if a person is treated for NGU and they're treated with doxycycline um, and they have persistent sim symptoms, but there's a gap between when they were initially treated and when they were next tested for MGENT. Um, so it then, and then they have positive MGENT. Would you do, would you redo the course of doxycycline and immediately go to MOXI or would you just do MOXI and what would be, what's the acceptable gap between the two? That's a great question. And if any of you all are guidelines readers, you'll see that it's not actually referenced in there. So, um, and the reason why is because we don't have great data on that. Um, in looking at the studies um, that were involved in developing this guidance on sequential treatment, that gap may be about a week. Um, and so you might consider in individuals where it's been greater than a week, I think the example you used was two weeks, consider redosing with the doxy and then leading into the moxifloxacin. But I will say this is a gray zone area um, that we have um, yet to have good data on. Okay, and we have several questions about chlamydia and they all follow a perfect common theme. <laughs> so, which is um, basically about when to, when to, when you might do shared decision-making about azithromycin use as opposed to doxycycline. So let me find the first one because it was very well worded. Um, where are you? I'm buried in MGENT, sorry. Um, okay, so um, so uh, a woman or a person with CT um, who is not engaging in anal sex, is it mm -hmm. still okay to treat with azithromycin? Mm -hmm. So that's a great question. I think this comes up a lot in clinical practice. I, I don't wanna say it's ever not okay to treat with azithromycin because obviously part of the shared decision-making approach is choosing what's best for you and your, your for, well, best for your patient. Um, in general, for individuals who are either pregnant or at risk of pregnancy, azithromycin is going to be the preferred option because doxycycline is contraindicated in pregnancy. For patients at particularly high risk of rectal infection, like men who have sex with men and others, I think, you know, very strongly come down on the doxycycline side. You know, there's a lot of data, some of which I presented earlier, that shows that even women who don't engage in receptive anal sex have high risk or high risk. Uh, case rates of uh, rectal chlamydia from auto inoculation. And so what you're really trying to prevent is the fact that if you inadequately treat their rectal chlamydia from auto inoculation, they could then get recurrent genital urinary infection and it can go back and forth until it's treated adequately. Um, and so you really do wanna encourage them to take doxycycline if they're willing and able to. Um, and then this was a similar question, but it was um, when somebody that routinely tests all three sites and they know that the pharyngeal and rectal sites are negative, mm -hmm. um, then can you safely choose azithromycin? They were concerned about adherence because of treating adolescents. Yeah, I think especially with adolescents, which I treat a lot of as well, you know, adherence is a big concern. And if you have three site testing and you know that rectal testing was negative, I think in that case, using azithromycin is a very reasonable approach. Okay, and I had a couple of trichomonas questions and then I might mix bag it because there are a lot of kind of mixed bag questions here. So um, so with trichomonas, so with the um, uh, 
the change in the guidance about alcohol avoidance or not. Um, it was mentioned alcohol being avoided after tinidazole or metronidazole, um, but is that the same for during, during, can you clarify what the, what the alcohol guidance is? Is it okay, like if somebody's had it before, not after, during, um, or is it just to be avoided because of GI upset? The, you, the thought was it used to have to be avoided, um, but on another look at the data, it looks like now you do not, no longer have to avoid alcohol when you're using metronidazole or tinidazole. So whether it's before yeah. or after, there doesn't appear to be an interaction. And why is the trichomonas regimen now different for men and women? <laughs> it mostly has to do with the, the studies that were used to say the seven days was more effective uh, was, this, was a study in women. And so it's more lack of data um, in men in that population. Okay. Um, and we have some screening and specimen um, questions. Um, so can you elaborate on what it means to screen on an opt-out basis? So Barbara, I'm not sure if that question is meant for me, but um, in the prevention okay. section in the special populations, there was the comment about opt-out screening for chlamydia, gonorrhea, trichomonas, syphilis, and HIV in correctional settings. Opt-out screening means, means that screening is offered universally and patients are kind of informed that it's going to be performed unless they decline it. And the specimen collection, I suppose anyone can answer, um, which is asking about urine gnats. Um, a lot of lab instructions say that the person should not have urinated for an hour. Um, does, if somebody has urinated less than an hour, is their specimen, they can, they're finding conflicting information about the hour time frame. I'll chime in here and just mention that most of us recommend that it depends on the package insert of the particular kit that you're using. That was the way that kit was studied and is best used to its best effect. So basically, if you don't use it the way the manufacturer recommends, you're out on a limb in terms of not always knowing the consequences, perhaps taking a hit in terms of the sensitivity and going from there. Um, let's see, is there a website to follow GC resistance in the US? Is there a just web website? <laughs> Yes, there is a great website out there and you will see the data on GISP as well as um, Surge available on the CDC website. Um, let's see. And um, yes, somebody wanted to make sure they heard correctly. Patients do not need to avoid alcohol with metronidazole. Raise the glass. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, okay. And several resource questions, um, which I think we can probably drop those links into the chat. Um, um, one person was asking if there is kind of a overview that can, you know, instead of having to read 200 pages, is there like an executive summary or some kind of overview? And the answer to that would be yes. Hopefully these are being dropped in the chat as I speak. Um, are, when are the pocket guides available and how do you get them? Hopefully that will also be dropped in the chat as I speak. Um, and <laughs> when will the app be updated? But I think that was being typed as you were speaking. <laughs> okay. Um, there were this, now I'm really in my mixed bag, but there were a couple of questions about um, urea plasma as a cause of NGU or when to test for urea plasma instead of mycoplasma? Any responded? So that's a great question. The data on those two pathogens is, is inconsistent. And so there are actually no recommendations for targeted screening for those particular pathogens um, in the guidelines, so. Barb, did we get to the question about which treponemal antibody test is best? There is one coming in about ah, mm -hmm. the patient 
uh, many pregnant women who have a positive FTA absorbed. Um, at county, we retest for trepidemol antibody times two. They are negative. What is the guideline? So um, keep in mind that when you get uh, essentially a treponemal test that is reactive, no matter what treponemal test it is, uh, the next step is gonna be to get a, a non-treponemal test like the RPR. If the RPR is reactive, then most likely the patient has syphilis and you move from there, you stage them and you treat them appropriately. If the RPR is non-reactive though, then the recommendation is always to get a second treponemal test to make sure that the first treponemal test is in fact a true positive and not a false positive. And so if that second different treponemal test, and the recommendation usually is for a TPPA because of its specificity, uh, if that second test is actually uh, non-reactive, then the most likely explanation is that the patient has a false positive first treponemal test and the patient doesn't have syphilis. But remember, ladies and gentlemen, you always interpret syphilis serologies in the context of a history. They are meaningless outside of the context of a history. So if the patient comes in and says, guess what? I recently had condomless sexual exposure and there's <laughs> one positive treponemal test. You just say, you know what? I don't have time to check another one. I'm gonna go ahead and retreat or treat you um, uh, uh, empirically because the risk of not treating is far outweighed uh, by the, the sitting, uh, sitting around waiting for another test. So always interpret these tests within the context of the clinical history. But usually one positive, the other one negative, it's usually a false positive. Rarely, it can be early syphilis with one turning positive before the other one turning positive. That would be unlikely. And there is one important clinical syphilis question that slipped right by me as well. So I'm gonna come back to it, which is if there is a patient that has reactive treponemal testing, but a non-reactive RPR, and they have neurologic or otic symptoms, um, should they get an LP. So again, within the clinical context, uh, assuming that you know you're thinking about syphilis, and that's the reason why you ordered these tests, right? So you get a reactive treponemal test, and then you get a non-reactive. RPR. The next step is to get a different treponemal test to see if that first treponemal test is a true positive or not. Assuming that the second treponemal test is actually a true positive, then the patient has syphilis. And then the question becomes, they have neurological signs and symptoms. The possibility is that they could have neurosyphilis. You need to do a lumbar puncture to rule out possibility of neurosyphilis. The lumbar puncture is a very useful test for neurosyphilis because a negative lumbar puncture rules out neurosyphilis. It does not rule out otosyphilis. It does not rule out ocular syphilis. So if they come in and they have a negative RPR, but they have positive treponemal tests and they have ocular only signs and symptoms, you do not need to do a lumbar puncture. You just have to decide if you want to treat them for ocular syphilis or not, if there's a better explanation elsewhere that it's not ocular syphilis. Same thing if they have only otic manifestations, you have to decide if you think that it's otic syphilis based on pretest probability, the likelihood. Is there any other good explanation why they should have hearing loss? If there's no other good explanation, then it's syphilis and you will go ahead and treat them for otic syphilis. So for neurological signs and symptoms, do an LP. For otic or ocular, use your clinical judgment and decide if they have ocular syphilis or otic syphilis. Great question, thanks. And then I'm returning to um, gonorrhea as well. So a patient with pharyngeal and rectal gonorrhea um, and reported cephalus for an allergy. And I think initially the questioner said they were treated with suffixane, but then clarified they were not. They were treated with gentamicin plus azithromycin. So they have a positive test of cure. If not a re-exposure reinfection, what are the treatment options? That's a great question. And I think this gets at that when you're using that regimen, that is the gentamicin and azithromycin regimen for allergy indications specifically, I would wanna make sure that individual had a true allergy because the tried and true, the best treatment that we can provide is going to be that cephalosporin regimen with ceftriaxone. So this is one where you might consider, um, of course, if this is not a critical situation, getting your allergist involved 
to help you tease out what's going on there with that allergy and seeing if there's a way that you can give them the recommended treatment of ceftriaxone. Now that is not always possible. We know that oftentimes you practice in settings where we don't have a referral base for allergy. Um, and in those cases, you wanna make sure those individuals are closely followed. So if you gave them the gentamicin and azithromycin regimen, making sure they get that test of cure done uh, so that you can follow and make sure that infection is cleared would be really important. Anything else to add? Um, Kathy, I see you wanna chip in. I'll just add that um, it's important for people to realize that the reason that the gentamicin and azithromycin alternative regimen is only listed for GU and very specific sites is because we actually do have data that the aminoglycosides don't have great action for pharyngeal elimination. It often fails there. So it's not recommended in a setting where you truly uh, know that the person is a carrier within the pharynx. Okay, a couple quick syphilis questions. We have like five minutes. Um, in non-pregnant patients, what is the max time between treatment before starting over? So uh, I'm gonna tell you, <laughs> uh, uh, I, we, we use 10 days. The data suggests that anywhere between 10 to 13 days, but when you look at the data carefully, 10 days is fairly good. 13 days becomes iffy. So uh, the recommendation is, uh, well, my recommendation is go with 10 days and call it a day. Uh, if they come in on day 11, just start over again. So nine days in pregnant persons, 10 days in non-pregnant persons. Uh, if the patient absolutely refuses at day 11 and they're non-pregnant, you might sleep just fine if you just kept going with it. It's gonna be probably okay, but put a certain number and the number that we have in Baltimore is 10 days. So I'm gonna say 10 days from Baltimore. Mm -hmm. And then for late, for to consider adequate maternal treatment, um, to have therapy, to have adequate syphilis treatment, 30 days before delivery. If someone's getting treated for late syphilis or unknown duration, would it be 30 days from the first dose or 30 days from the last dose? Conservatively, it's the last dose. Ideally, you want 30 days from the last dose. So um, uh, that's conservatively. But you know, the ultimate issue is try and get that treatment on board as soon as you can. That's the most important thing in pregnancy because the more time that elapses between the initiation of treatment and delivery, the less likely you are to wind up with a catastrophe at delivery. And um, in complicated, I'm gonna, this is, they're asking about complicated syphilis, but I would think complicated disseminated gonorrhea, any kind of complicated STI, would infectious disease be the specialist to refer to? <laughs> I just wanted to see everybody nod. <laughs> um, how are we with time, Helen or Nexi? I say we could take one more if you have one more, Barbara, and then we can. Okay. Can Let me see if I can get like a power punch for the end. Um, let's see here. Kathy, do you see one that you think is the is is one that we've missed altogether? Not oh, really, but I may be skimming too quickly. And I think we've covered quite a bit of territory. I mm -hmm. can just imagine a number of participants raising their hand and saying their brains are full. <laughs> and we are still available post-webinar. I think many of you have grown to the understand that many of us are very practical and working on the front lines alongside you. So when you ask questions of the NNPDC network or even the CDC, you'll often get one of us answering your questions. So please do stay in touch. So glad you were able to join us today and I'll pass it over to any of the others who have final words of wisdom. All right, thank you all so much for joining us. I wanna give our panelists a round of applause for all of your efforts and the information you covered today. You're getting some kudos in the chat.
Once again, you will receive an email from us by end of today or early tomorrow, depending on your time zone with the evaluation instructions. Thank you so much for all you do for the field of STI prevention and sexual health. And we hope that you have a great rest of your day. Thank you so much. All right, bye everyone. And we will end the webinar and panelists will follow up with you all via email.